It is a big day for Shimano today because after months of speculation and spy shots and leaks and all sorts of other things, we finally have the official introduction of the new DuraAce Di2 R9200 electronic road group set. And also for the first time, Shimano is launching the Altegra Di2 version on the same day. That one's called R8100. And we have an awful lot to talk about because there's a whole lot of new features on these two new group sets. I should point out that those two groups that are nearly identical to each other in everything except for weight, essentially. So pretty much everything that I talk about in this video, unless I specify otherwise, will apply to both Dura-Ace and Altegra. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. So as we have all been expecting, Dura-Ace and Altegra have gone to a semi-wireless format, or we can call it wiredless if we'd like to. Uh, each lever is completely independent of each other. They're not attached to anything. But the two derailers are linked together to a central battery that is once again hidden away somewhere inside the frame. Why didn't Shimano go with a fully wireless setup? Well, one advantage of this setup is that you still have that really big 5,000 milliamp hour battery that you had before, the same capacity anyway, uh, and that gives you a lot longer runtime. Shimano says that you can get about a thousand kilometers at least from the derailers before the system needs to be recharged. And then the replaceable CR1632 coin cell batteries that are in each shifter can run for about a year and a half or two years before those need to be replaced. So it's worth noting those are longer run times than what SRAM is offering. Again, it's not a fully wireless system, but overall, once you have everything set up, it's not really that big of a deal. As far as the wireless setup up front, however, that is really the key portion here because especially at OEM manufacturing levels or even for shops or independent builders that are putting bikes together, routing that wire up front like through the handlebar and stem with all these crazy convoluted integrated cockpits and internal routing setups that are up front on modern road bikes now, that was far and away the biggest hassle. So Shimano has gotten rid of that. Running the wire through the rest of the frame in the back, you just have a wire going from the rear derailleur and from the front derailleur, meeting up usually up at the seat post or somewhere in the frame down here. That part isn't really that big of a deal, so that part is a little bit of a hassle, certainly as compared to Axis, but overall up front, it's still a lot easier to deal with. Despite the fact that the system is now wireless, Shimano is actually saying that signals go from the levers to the rear derailleur faster than they used to before. That is largely due to a faster processor in the rear derailleur that translates those signals quicker. Uh, and shifts themselves are also claimed to be faster too because of new tooth shaping that's borrowed from the mountain bike sides called Hyperglide Plus. Uh, and the derailleurs themselves also just move faster than they did before. So overall, Shimano is claiming about a 50% increase in shift speed, uh, depending on which direction and whether it's front or rear, give or take. Uh, but overall, it is still an improvement. Another neat thing is because all of the wireless hardware is now built in directly into the rear derailleur, uh, you don't have to run a separate D-Fly wireless unit like you did before. And then what you used to have for the function button on that junction A box is now integrated directly into the rear derailleur. There's a little button and LED back there. Uh, there's also LEDs integrated into each lever. So that tells you stuff like battery life and adjustment mode, that sort of thing. So it's all pretty handy. It's all pretty neatly integrated. It's pretty nicely done. Going along with all this is an updated eTube app, which works once again with iOS or Android smartphone uh, operating systems. You can use this to customize the shift button programming or the shift speed or the uh, synchro shift modes, that sort of thing. It's all sorts of customization options that are in there. It's quite easy to use. It's very easy to set up. Shimano seems to have done a pretty good job with that too. The other big piece of news is that yes, Shimano has gone to a 12 speed setup in the back. Why 12 speed? Wasn't 11 enough? Well, wasn't 10 enough or nine or eight? Uh, we've heard this argument every time a component brand has introduced an extra sprocket on the rear cassette and the answers are still the same as they were before if you retain the same overall range as you had with fewer sprockets now by adding an extra gear you have smaller jumps in the middle or you can basically keep the same jumps in the middle and add a little bit of extra range and honestly aside from a little bit of the hassle with the compatibility thing i mean it's hard to argue against that line of reasoning in terms of cassette sizes Dura Ace and Altegra will both have 1130 and 1134 cassettes to start. Dura Ace will add an 1128 later for road racing. As far as the cassette construction goes, the largest five sprockets on Dura Ace are titanium, the rest are steel. On Altegra, they're all steel, but either way, the largest six sprockets are riveted in two mini clusters to aluminum carriers to save a little bit of weight. Uh, the spline pattern is different, but before you go into the garage and freak out about all your wheels that are no longer compatible, 
What's nice is that Shimano has made the new cassettes backward compatible with older 11-speed freehub bodies. The new 12-speed cassettes will fit on 11-speed bodies. However, the new 12-speed hubs that are out there will only accept 12-speed cassettes, so keep that in mind. While the compatibility is good one way, it's not good the other way. Other thing that's worth mentioning is that with this 1134 cassette and with that 5034 tooth chainring combo, we now have available for the first time from Shimano a stock one-to-one -one climbing gear available, which if you like to go uphill and if you don't like to go uphill very fast or if you're just not very good at going uphill fast, like me, that is a very good thing. You probably don't need to reach for those subcompact chain rings anymore. It's just nice to have that option. It's nice to see that Shimano has kind of kept real world riders in, in mind and not just top level pro racers. Another thing to consider, why didn't Shimano go with a 10 tooth sprocket like SRAM did with their access setups? Well, according to Shimano, uh, they have said that they didn't want to increase drivetrain friction by going with a 10 or by downsizing the whole thing in general. So by keeping everything pretty much normal sized, they are able to maintain existing low levels of drivetrain friction. We don't have data to support that, however. A little bit of a controversial subject, but th that's Shimano's story, so that's what we're reporting. As far as the rest of the drivetrain goes, the crankset construction is pretty much the same as it used to be. Shimano is sticking with aluminum. The drive side cranks, crank arms are basically made in like a two-piece clamshell setup like they were before with two halves that are bonded together. Uh, there's a spindle, 24 millimeter steel spindle bonded to the, or pressed and bonded to the drive side crank arm. And then the left side crank arm is a one piece hollow forging with two pinch bolts, just like it was before, no changes there. Shimano is once again using four bolt chain rings. They once again bolt directly to the backside of the drive side crank arm. The bolt pattern looks pretty similar to what it was before. It is once again a 110 millimeter bolt circle diameter. However, the location of the tabs are a little bit different. It's more of a symmetrical design as opposed to the old asymmetrical design. Of course, the new chain rings and the old chain rings are not compatible with new and old crank arms. It's Shimano, go figure. That's kind of just how it goes. As far as the derailers go, one of the biggest differences is up front because the front derailleur is positively tiny. And that is despite the fact that Shimano says that the front derailleurs and the rear derailleurs move faster than they did before. So that's pretty impressive. Definitely one upside to having that central battery. One thing that's pretty obviously missing from the rear derailleurs, however, is a pulley cage clutch. I asked Shimano about that and their response was that Durace and Altegra are still intended for conventional road riding and road racing. So they decided that a pulley cage clutch just wasn't really necessary. This isn't really a gravel group after all. As far as the chains go, you are probably already aware that Shimano already uses 12-speed formats on the mountain bike side. So they've just carried over the mountain bike chains over to the roadside since the sprocket to sprocket spacing is the same, the overall spread is the same, it's all compatible. Uh, on the Dura-A side, Shimano is using the XTR chain and on the Altegra side, they're using the Dior XT chain. No changes to the chain whatsoever. Same updated shaping as on the mountain bike side, a little bit more chamfering on the outer plates, runs a little bit quieter than the old 11 speed stuff. Still have the optional master link. Same as before, no changes there. One area that Shimano stated pretty early on that they wanted to improve was their road disc brakes. Shimano's road disc brakes were really never criticized very much for power. There was always plenty of power. However, they had kind of more of like a binary on-off feeling. The, the, the pads, you know, you hit, there was a very firm point where the pads hit the rotors and then the, the levers were pretty stiff from there. And that's something that Shimano wanted to address with these moving forward. So to fix that, they've borrowed the servo wave technology from the mountain bike side. Essentially what you have is a variable leverage ratio inside the lever. And what that does is it brings the pads to the rotor a little bit quicker, shortens the lever stroke before the levers hit. Uh, and then from there, the levers kind of soften up a little bit so you can kind of control that power a little bit better than you did before. Uh, the other nice thing is Shimano has increased pad clearance at the rotor a little bit more, just by 10%, that, so they're saying. It's not a huge amount. Uh, it, it should still help a little bit with lining everything up and keeping things from making noise and rubbing. Speaking of noise, Shimano has now ditched the road-specific rotors that they used before. And they are now just carrying over the mountain bike rotors. Uh, the reason why? Well, they are a little bit lighter, uh, but more importantly, Shimano has found that they are less prone to heat deformation. Sort of that telltale like ting, ting, ting that you get after a long descent or after breaking hard on a steep descent. Uh, that used to happen because the rotors would get hot. They would kind of deform just a little bit. And then uh, that perfect little clearance that you used to have with the rotor through the pads would go away for a little while until the, until the, the rotors cooled down. So with the mountain bike rotors, that is supposed to be a little bit better and combined with the little bit of extra pad clearance, the brakes should run a little bit quieter. And then once again, you do have the option for satellite shifters. 
Uh, Shimano has simplified the naming. Now you just have shift, satellite shifters for the tops or satellite shifters for the drops. Uh, and then they have kind of reverted back to a previous setup where the, the, the switches are you know, so-called dumb. There's no circuitry in them. They basically just, they're just dummy switches. Um, and then those just plug into accessory ports on the levers. And they're a lot smaller than they were before because they don't have any circuitry inside them. Uh, and so it, it's a little bit nice that they're a little bit smaller, a little bit easier to set up, a little bit easier to hide inside uh, handlebar tape, that sort of thing. That seems like a good move to me. Going along with all the new components are a trio of new wheels each for Durace and Altegra. And for the first time, all the Altegra wheels are carbon rims instead of aluminum rims. Uh, the rim shapes are shared between Altegra and Durace. They have a 20 millimeter internal width, 28 millimeter in, uh, external width. Not super wide. Again, this is all meant for traditional road riding, so Shimano didn't want to go with anything super wide. Weights are pretty competitive. The rim shapes seem pretty modern with, you know, they're again, fairly fat, pretty blunted edges. Uh, bladed spokes. Uh, Shimano is offering them in three different depths, 36, 50, and 60 millimeter. Uh, on the Dura-A side, you do have the option for what, what they're calling a high rigidity uh, that 60 millimeter version that uses a thicker spoke and also two to one lacing up front for sprinters or heavier riders or anyone who wants a little bit stiffer wheel up front. Uh, primarily, Shimano is pushing the tubeless clincher version of these. There will be tubulars available on the Dura-A side and that's really mainly meant for road racing and for uh, kind of the European market really. In terms of free hub bodies, as I mentioned, there is a new 12-speed specific free hub body uh, that will be used on both Dura-Ace and Altegra, of course. And on Dura-Ace, for the first time, that body is aluminum. And the reason why they're able to get away with that versus the old titanium ones is because with this new spline, you have twice as much surface area to distribute the load, so you don't have to worry about the sprockets digging into the free hub body as much. Uh, for Altegra, that body still steel, uh, adds a little bit of weight, saves a fair bit of cost, however. Either way, all the hubs continue to be cup and cone bearing instead of cartridges. Some people have different opinions on that. I personally find that cup and cone is a lot more serviceable and they're a lot more durable. Uh, I like that they can be more easily tuned than cartridge bearings. They're easier to replace, I think. And then also they actually need to be replaced a lot less often than cartridge bearings. So I think that Shimano has made a good move there. It's certainly not the popular way to go, but if you look at what, I guess Campagnolo particularly and Shimano were doing with their wheels, Cup and cone is just a natural way to go as long as you know how to use it. Okay, so of course, I'm sure all of you have questions as far as compatibility between the new 12-speed stuff and the old 11-speed stuff. There are some bright sides. Again, the rotors are shared, the disc pads are the same. Aside from that though, there's not really a whole lot to be happy about because even according to Shimano, they've basically say, said that more or less anything that is 11 speed is not compatible with anything 12 speed. Uh, and part of that is again, part of that new, uh, due to the new wiring system where the new wire heads are smaller, you just can't plug the stuff in. That's super frustrating, particularly since one of the draws of electronic drivetrains is supposed to be that at least in theory, they can be programmed to kind of move however you want them to. You want it to shift on a 12 speed cluster? Sure, 11 speed, sure. You want it to shift on, you know, Suntour's old seven speed, non uneven accu shift cassette? In theory, you should be able to do that. And aftermarket companies like, you know, Archer, for example, have proven that that is possible. What's even more frustrating, however, is that even Shimano has shown that it, this is possible because they haven't developed any new controls for the time trial or triathlon market. Instead, they have an adapter box that they've developed uh, together with some new firmware where you can plug in the old cables into one side and then you can plug the new cable into the other end and, connect, and you can connect everything together. You can't run that setup wirelessly. However, you can still run the older 11 speed time trial and try stuff up front with the new 12 speed stuff out back and have a 12 speed setup. Shimano has not bothered to do that with the 11 speed controls. So unfortunately, if you want to go 12 speed, you gotta buy the whole thing. Uh, again, super frustrating, quite disappointed about it. Pretty bummed to see that from your Shimano. What about mechanical Durace? What about mechanical Altegra? What about rim brakes? On the rim brake front, there is good news there because once again, this is pretty frustrating, Shimano has taken the existing DI2 rim brake levers and they were able to adapt those to the new 12 speed wiring. So those don't have wireless hardware in them. They basically are the old 11 speed levers, but they have been adapted and modified to work with the new 12 speed wiring. Uh, again, proving that they, that electrical hardware can be made to work with a 12 speed setup. Brake calipers themselves haven't changed. That's fine. The original, uh, the old brake calipers really work quite well. So I'm not really sure what Shimano would have done anyway. 
Uh, the finishes are close enough so that you don't really have to worry about them kind of sticking out and looking kind of funny. Pretty much all good there. Good news if you're into rim brakes. However, on the mechanical drivetrain question, they're done. There is no longer a mechanical Dura-Ace drivetrain. More shockingly, there is no longer a mechanical Altegra drivetrain, at least not in 12-speed anyway. Uh, Shimano says they will continue producing 11-speed Altegra mechanical for probably at least another model year or so. After that, though, it seems like they're pretty much just going with all electronic. From there, moving forward, I mean, is, is 105 going to go the same way? Mm, hard to say. I mean, 105 is definitely a price point road group set. Seems more likely that they'll stick with mechanical just to, to keep the price down. But if you were a fan of higher end mechanical drivetrains, particularly from Shimano, that is a huge bummer. Because now SRAM had essentially already let go of the high end mechanical road market. Now Shimano is doing the same. Campagnolo is really about your only choice now on that front. One bright spot in all of this is packaging, interestingly enough. Shimano packaging has always comprised a mix of plastic and paper-based stuff. The plastic was always marked so that you kind of knew what to do with it, uh, but it was basically like a plastic bag, so you usually couldn't put it in municipal recycling bins. Now, Shimano has gone to a 100% paper setup, and instead of the little plastic bags and stuff that they always used to use, essentially what you have are these sort of like white paper bags that actually kind of look like cookie bags. Um, the boxes themselves don't use as much ink. They're kind of just more plain. They almost kind of look like just brown paper boxes uh, with a little bit of printing on them. It's a nice move from a sustainability standpoint. Uh, there's an awful lot of Shimano product that gets put on bikes. There's an awful lot of Shimano product that goes through bike shops. Personally, I think that's going to mean an awful lot of plastic that stays out of landfill. So good move, Shimano. As for things like weight and pricing and availability, uh, for weights and prices, you can head over to the written article on SockingTips.com where all those are laid out in a nice, easy to read chart. But as far as availability goes, Shimano says that complete bikes with new Altegra, with new Dura-Ace, should theoretically be available basically while you're watching this video. Uh, in limited quantities, I'm sure, uh, but basically any OEM brand that uses Shimano will probably have an Altegra or Dura-Ace 12-speed group set on bikes that are on the floor, presumably now. Uh, as far as aftermarket goes, Shimano says that the parts will begin to be available sometime around October. I expect that they'll be pretty hard to find. I'm sure Shimano's ramping up, ramping up their factories as much as they can, but just given how things are, my guess is that they'll be pretty tough to come by, so maybe put in your pre-orders now if you can. As far as the overall weights go, however, it's basically a wash, uh, despite the fact that Shimano has added a 12th sprocket. Uh, Durace actually has gotten a little bit heavier, uh, about 10 grams, give or take a couple of grams, and then the same thing on the Altegra side. So neither group set is lighter than it used to be, but the fact that they've added a 12th sprocket while keeping the weight the same seemed pretty good to me. All right, enough with all the tech talk. How did I like all this stuff on the road? Well, I have been fortunate enough to be able to ride this new Dura-Ace Di2 setup for the last couple of weeks. Uh, a few things to point out. This is not a long-term review. This is kind of more my first impressions. Again, I've only had this for a couple of weeks. Uh, I also have not had a chance to try out the new Altegra stuff because Shimano has not had media samples available yet. That all said, the shift performance on this bike really is pretty amazing, which is especially impressive considering that the 11-speed stuff was already so good. Uh, that increase in shift speed that Shimano was talking about, it is noticeable. It's not dramatic, but it is noticeable. Uh, and it basically just further widens the gap between Shimano and competitors in terms of how fast the chain moves from sprocket to sprocket or chain ring to chain ring. Um, those chain movements are kind of in typical Shimano fashion, super, super smooth. Whether you are downshifting or upshifting, up front or up back, the chain movement is impeccably good. Uh, whatever sort of voodoo Shimano is doing as far as the tooth shaping, it is working. The drivetrain is also really quiet. I had heard before that some people like to run the 12-speed mountain bike chains on their 11-speed road drivetrains, and that seems to quiet things up. I'm pretty interested to try it now because this thing does run, again, super quietly. Uh, sections of road that I've been on where there was a, a tailwind, for example, I actually heard the tires on the road more than I heard the drivetrain. So well done on that Shimano. This stuff runs really quietly. As I mentioned earlier, I do still tend to ride my road bikes on a lot of dirt roads. Not really sure how typical that is. We do have really good access to good, uh, to good dirt roads here in Boulder, Colorado. I personally still would have liked to see the option of a clutch on this road derailleur to kind of keep things quieter. Um, not really that big of a deal. Again, I'm not sure how, 
how many people are going to be in that same situation. I am sure that Shimano again has done the, its, its homework on this. I'm sure that has its data that shows that the clutch is not really necessary. Uh, I would have liked to have had it nonetheless, but anyway, that's just me. Um, as far as the lever ergonomics go, if you like the old Shimano levers, I will say that I'm pretty sure you will like these, mainly because the girth of these levers hasn't really changed very much. They're still pretty small. I personally like the slightly longer body because I have kind of bigger hands. Um, kind of gives me a little bit more to wrap my fingers around. If you're really sensitive to bike fit, however, that slightly longer lever may require a slight change in your position. Uh, so keep that in mind. As far as that kind of bigger peak on the front, I, I spend a lot of time with my hands kind of outstretched with my with kind of that peak kind of in my palm like that. And for me, it works quite well. I like it. Um, it's also kind of neat that you still have that little secret button up here for, that you can program to operate your computer pages or you know, to use as an extra shift button. So that's pretty nice. Uh, and then that new app is really quite easy to use. Uh, it's really nice that they, they have made it so user-friendly. Uh, as far as the shift buttons go, the height differential is, is noticeable. I do like that there's a little bit more texture to it. You can kind of tell them apart a little bit better. It's still not that different uh, as far as between the buttons go. And personally, I kind of like the more idiot proof nature of ETAP Go. So for me, I go ahead and program uh, my DI2 shifters to be a little bit more ETAP like. Uh, both buttons on my right shifter go to harder gears. Both buttons on the left shifter go to easier gears with one controlling the front derailleur and one controlling the rear. But that's just how I set my stuff up. Uh, I would suspect that with full finger gloves, the, these buttons are still getting me a little bit trickier to, to tell apart relative to something like ETAP, where it's just like one big fat lever on either side. But overall, it is still easier to tell the buttons apart, so I'm pretty happy to see that improvement. What's a little bit more noticeable is the improvement in the brakes. Uh, that slight increase in pad clearance doesn't really seem all that super significant to me. 10% of not very much is still not very much. Uh, what is more noticeable, however, to me is that servo wave linkage. While I did like Shimano brakes quite a lot. I did really like them for how much power they delivered. I preferred SRAM and Campagnolo in terms of uh, the way that they modulated it a little bit better. Shimano seems to have closed that gap with the servo wave setup. The levers move less now before the pads contact the rotor, which I prefer. Uh, and then there's a little bit of a softer feel once those pads are on the rotor, so you do have a little bit more control. So I think that's a pretty good improvement. Uh, as far as the noise goes, I can't really say that they were noticeably quieter than before. Uh, maybe a little bit hard to say without doing exact back-to-back -back testing. Um, I did still experience just a little bit of that kind of like ting, ting, ting sound that you get with, you know, after a long descent or after a particularly steep descent. It wasn't bad, um, but it wasn't nothing either. So that's maybe something to keep in mind as well. As far as the whole wireless thing goes, to be completely honest with you, I'm, I'm a little bit indifferent uh, because the whole wireless thing is super neat. Anytime I have to build up a new bike, Axis in particular, if I have to build a new bike up with Axis, I'm kind of like doing a little happy dance here because it's just so easy. There's nothing to connect. Everything just kind of bolts on, you push some buttons and you're good to go. With this setup, yeah, you, you eliminate the hassle of the wiring up front, but you do have to keep in mind that you only have to really deal with that more often than not just once. So once everything is all wired up, most people are never going to touch it again. Personally, I'm a lot happier to see that the run battery runtime on this is so good. I did not run the battery all the way down. I haven't had the bike for that long. Um, but the fact that you have that much longer runtime to me is a big plus over the wireless thing, especially if it's all connected down here anyway, because you're not really taking that stuff apart anyway. With new bikes pretty much all moving to these crazy internal routing setups and these wacky one piece internal cockpits and all that, it does eliminate a lot of hassle up front, especially for OEM brands that are assembling all these bikes in factories. So regardless of how you feel about wireless, it's clearly the way it's just gonna keep on going. As for the wheels, I've got the 36 millimeter deep Dura-Ace uh, clinchers on here right now. They're light, they're snappy, they feel really good, they ride well. Um, they don't make a whole lot of noise, they're, they're relatively quiet. Uh, I would say the thing that I noticed most, however, was how nicely balanced they are at high speed. We've got quite a lot of descents here in town. It's pretty easy to hit speeds 80, 90 K an hour. Uh, and what I found really nice is how, how, again, how perfectly balanced they are. They really kind of feel the same whether you're going 80 K an hour or 18 K an hour, which is quite impressive. Uh, so that says a lot about, to me, I think the manufacturing reliability and kind of the repeatability of these rims. I'll be curious to see how the 50 and 60 millimeter deep ones are in situations like, you know, heavy crosswinds, that sort of thing. But overall, first impressions on the wheels are pretty good. Uh, and the fact that they're quite a bit wider than before, I think will make these wheels a lot more relevant to a lot more buyers now than they used to. 
So overall, what did I think about this stuff? Like I said, Shimano's biggest problem may be the fact that the 11 speed stuff was just already so good. There are tangible and multiple improvements throughout on this thing. Like I said, the levers, the shift speed, the shift quality, the, the gear ratios, the braking performance, that sort of thing. It's not really that huge or dramatic a difference, however. I mean, if, if, if I'm someone who already has Dura-Ace 11 speed Dura DI2 or Altegra 11 speed DI2, unless I really, really wanted that extra range or if a jump somewhere in the middle of the, middle of the cassette really bothered me, I'm not sure how much I'd be motivated to switch, particularly since there is no weight advantage uh, with the new stuff over the old stuff. That said, if I were buying a new bike, however, and I had the option of going with Altegra or Dura-Ace 12-speed DI2, this stuff is really good. And again, it is better than the 11-speed stuff. And the fact that Shimano was able to make meaningful improvements over what was already two really exceptional group sets is not to be ignored. The stuff is really good. Again, whether it's good enough to just kind of ditch your current stuff and upgrade, that's not really something I can answer. All right, those are my thoughts on the new 12-speed Dura-Ace DI2 R9200 and Altegra DI2 R8100 electronic group sets. If you liked what you saw here today, please go ahead and click that like button below. If you haven't already subscribed to our channel, please go ahead and do so. Tell your friends about cycling tips on YouTube as well. Make sure you check out the more detailed uh, written article on cyclingtips.com for more specifics on the whole tech setup and you know kind of more impressions on how what I thought about about riding. Uh, and if you haven't already done so, please consider becoming a Velo Club member because it really does make it easier for us to bring you content like this. So with that said, thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.